Morning folks, Andy Cup Davey and the truck. Coming to you this morning from our broth, where it's clearing up, lots of blue sky, extremely warm, 18 degrees. That's no bad for five minutes to nine in the morning. Really lovely morning. Anyway, we'll start today as we do every day with a coronavirus update, okay? So, here we go. These are the daily figures. Um, tested in hospital um, here in Scotland, or by the NHS here in Scotland, because these are no, all, these don't include the tests that are being done at the um, five UK operated test sites here. Uh, the ones that are at the airports in Edinburgh and Glasgow and at the Motherwell and things like that, okay? So tested in Scotland 90,421 and that's an increase of 1,418 as I say, but that's only the hospital done tests, okay? Tested positive 14,655 There was 61 new cases discovered yesterday Okay, these numbers are accumulative. Active cases, 1,704, and that's a drop of 95. Now, this has been steadily coming down. These are the cases that are in coronavirus wards and intensive care units, or have been discharged to, um, to recover at home, or were sent home after a positive test because they were only having mild, uh, um, mild symptoms and they could recover at home, okay? Um, deaths, this is never a good number. 2,134, and that's plus 29 on the day before. Now, actually, I forgot to tell you that these are not the day's figures. These are yesterday's figures for the 19th to the 5th, 20. The new figures will be updated by the First Minister today at 12.30, when she... Um, addresses the nation and also today we should we will get um, the national records for Scotland's input as well now last week I believe it was a uh, after the national records for Scotland's input went in the, the mortality rate sprung from a thousand odds to three thousand twelve hundred a uh, three thousand two hundred and thirteen I expect today that that number will, will, will pass three and a half thousand when the national records of Scotland's input was in. As I say, these are no good numbers. Any deaths are tragedy. And a uh, commiserations to everybody who's lost a loved one during this, okay? Right, moving on. The attacks for the BBC, uh, for BBC um, here in Scotland and the BBC in general on um, the Scottish Government continues. Um, some of these attacks have been quite personal. Um, Sky even tried to, um, which wasn't the BBC, but as I say, the, the mainstream broadcasters, Sky even tried to make it look as if he tried to, again, basically accused the Prime Minister of murder. Uh, sorry, First Minister of murder. But anyway, it's Piers Morgan that's <laughs> accusing the Prime Minister of murder, and he's no missing. <laughs> anyway, BBC Scotland continue attacks on FM, uh, trying to pit the people of Scotland against their government. This was Sarah Smith, right? As we all know, she tried to say that Nicola was enjoying this a eh, crisis, right? But in that same report, she also suggested that the people of Scotland should ignore the Scottish government. What she actually said towards the end, it was whether the people of Scotland will put up with us or no, put up with stringier, eh, um, stronger lockdown measures than in other parts of the UK, meaning England. Because at that point in time, until Northern Ireland he, um, he eased up and it's locked down a wee bit, the other three nations were on lockstep. It was England that was out. But the suggestion was that the people of Scotland should disobey their government and he, get on about following the Westminster government. Let's get this straight, people. Scotland has um, specific demographics. Specific geography and its own specific healthcare system. Our NHS is specific to Scotland's needs, Scotland's population's needs. Now, you must, and this is not a flim flam, this is for bloody logical reasons, you must follow what's being said by our First Minister. 
She has all the info on this thing here in Scotland. Right, even had to set up their own scientific uh, advisory uh, committee because SAGE, the UK government scientific advisory group for a, um, are absolute push. Very few medical staff on it, mere modellers uh, and a data analysts on it, what there is, medical people. Ignore Westminster. Listen to the First Minister. Right. Now, last night as I was driving home, uh, in the Drive Time programme with John Beatty, it was suggested that uh, the crisis in care homes has been the biggest uh, failing since devolution started. Now, I've listened, I listened to that report last night. I went home and I read the report. Well, I skimmed it actually because I've got a lot today to prepare for a show. I skimmed that report and then again this morning when the, the, the author of that report on, uh, Nick Kemp, a previous a, um, director for elderly care in Glasgow, who wrote this report for the Commonweal, which remember the Commonweal is an extreme left wing think tank, right? So it thinks way beyond the centre ground of politics, which is a uh, prevalent here in Scotland. It thinks way left. But anyway, um, he was on this morning pitted against a uh, professor Jean. My oh Christ, I can't remember the second name. Public Health, the um, Professor of Public Health at Edinburgh University. Anyway, they were uh, on discussing this. The discussion went on. Now remember, this has been framed as the biggest crisis since devolution started. Because this is a, they're, they're getting in about the devolution settlement and all. So, anyway, a uh, Jean, a uh, Professor Jean, oh Christ, I haven't wrote it down either because obviously the programmes this morning, I don't normally report on on the day's news to the morrow. But uh, anyway, these two went at it. And I have to agree with the Professor of Public Health at Edinburgh University because when I skimmed it last night, it seemed to very, be very, very contradictory and it seemed to gloss over some important uh, points. Right. The privatisation of uh, social care. You know, that's care homes and things like that. That happened under Westminster's watch before devolution kicked in. Right. And these private uh, healthcare companies that run these care homes, they are ultimately responsible for things like uh, um, infection control and all that. Guidelines are laid out for Public Health Scotland, but they're ultimately uh, responsible for this. This has nothing. This scandal has got nothing to do with the Scottish government, which was pointed out by this director of uh, Public Health. For Edinburgh University, uh, Professor of Public Health for Edinburgh University. Whereas this uh, new uh, Nick Kemp and his fluffy headed thinking was contradicting himself the whole time. Right. But anyway, the, the, the gist of it is that um, we never quite got to why it was the biggest uh, scandal since devolution started. But the hobby it is uh, something that I said last week. Health and social care has to be taken back into uh, the control of the the, um, the NHS and the Scottish Government. Um, care homes and care in the community needs to be brought completely under the umbrella of the local authorities. I said this last week. <coughs> Probably, in fact, I think it was Wednesday last week. You look back at programmes on YouTube. Um... And the uh, nursing homes and palliative care has to be taken back into the hands of the NHS. I said this now, last week, and that's that's basically what this is saying. The failure of uh, the devolved administrations not to, not to bring all these things, uh, not to um, nationalise all these things. Uh, sorry, not to, not to have nationalised public uh, um, social care and the uh, care homes. In the 20 years it's been existing, that's the failure. That's the criminal thing. But of course, remember, the Commonweal is a left wing, an extreme left wing, wing think tank, think tank, and they think everything should be nationalised. Right. But I have to say, and I agree, I agree with them on this issue. But it wasn't a failure of the Scottish Government that we have at the moment. It's been a failure of all the Scottish governments since the devolution came in. But what I say, uh, the author of this support also doesn't take into consideration is 10 years of austerity where they couldn't afford to take these things back in-house. 
Simple as that. But what they can do now, which I hope they do with the Sky Care Home, because that's in front of the courts today to get its license revoked, is I hope they uh, just buy it. Just buy it, it'll go at rock bottom price anyway. And uh, as this thing unfolds and we get towards the end of this, a lot of these care home businesses are going to go out of business anyway because people don't want to put their elderly relatives into them anymore. So they're going to struggle. So now's the time to snap this sector up. The, the, the care home sector, get it back into uh, public hands. But, as I say, during these reports on the BBC, they still haven't explained why it's the biggest scandal since devolution started. But, I mean, if you start to add up what's going on in the mainstream media, the Telegraph, devolution's a mess and dangerous. BBC, biggest scandal since uh, devolution began. Without explaining why it's the biggest scandal since devolution began. It actually isn't he? You know, in the first ten years of Parliament, they didn't even get round to this. And the Scottish Government's only just started to integrate health and social care over the last few years. This situation might accelerate bringing a health and social care back into, um, back into the hands of the local authorities and back into the hands of the government, um, central government through the NHS. But as I say, I suggested that last week. That's what I think should be happening. But uh, this support in the common wheel by this uh, Nick Kemp, it's fluffy, it's airy, it's contradictory, and I just skimmed it. But uh, the attacks on uh, the Scottish Government by the mainstream media are getting outrageous. When you start to blame them for things that happened pre-devolution, then it's nuts. And then you, you, it's, you, you, you uh, have a go at them for no taking action that they couldn't take anyway because of budget constraints because of 10 years of austerity. Absolutely poor quality reporting. That's not even journalism. And as for Nick Kemp's uh, report, Remember, this guy's a previous director uh, of a uh, elderly care in Glasgow. That tells you that this guy is a uh, probably feel uh, he's probably a Labour supporter and he's probably a left wing socialist, um, but definitely a Labour supporter. So this would be an attack by a Labour done through the common wheel, which is a, as I say, it's a, a left wing socialist uh, think tank. I don't have anything against the common wheel. But people have to understand what it is. Robin that runs the common wheel, Christ Almighty, he's another Colin Fox. Alright. Um, moving on. Yeah. As I say, but um, these attacks, there's reasons for these attacks. There's politicking going on here. The SNP are being attacked, right? And that's because they're flying so high in the polls. I've spoken about this. Ignore these polls. The establishment is going to go full out on the SNP over the next 12 months as we run up to this uh, election. These attacks will continue and they will get worse. And they'll be personal against the First Minister, the same as they did with Alex Salmond, 2012 to 2014. They're already doing it. The First Minister in Scotland doesn't get addressed as First Minister. She gets called Sturgeon. Simple as that. Press when they're talking about Boris Johnson, it's Prime Minister Johnson. Talking about uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, then it's Sturgeon. These attacks are going to continue, and that's where these fringe parties could be a problem. I spoke about this a while ago. Now, I've already said I'm not against the idea of a mere democracy, mere political parties, mere voices being heard. But in the situation we're in, when we're trying to get ourselves another referendum and get away from Westminster, then people have to remember a year out for this election. Just under a year now, actually. But a year out for this election, a couple of days under a year, they are going to go flat out and the SNP will be discredited and you can watch them plummet in the polls. And this sort of poor quality reporting 
where the Scottish government and the First Minister doesn't get a right to reply is a... It's outrageous stuff. No right to reply against what uh, Sarah Smith said the other night. No right to reply last night when this Mr. Uh, Nick Kemp was making his accusations on drive time in Scotland. The drive time in Scotland's actually listening to you. the breakfast show this morning. Ah, nobody's listening to that. Some few old, uh, some fu old fuddy duddies that are out of their bed at this time in the morning and those political anarchs that want to keep an eye on what the BBC are up to. Right. But as I say, you know, forget the polls. We're a year out. And the attacks on the Scottish government and the attacks on the SNP and scandals that they will make up or scandals they will drag up. What are we going to try to do with the Alex Salmon trial? You know, they feel bloody miserable about Look what they tried to do with it. So, ignore the bloody polls. As to the new parties, as I say, I'm not against democracy. I'm not against mere voices coming to the table. But what I can see is that uh, the maths that they are setting this, these new parties up on and want you to get your second vote away on are based on polls that are a year out. And the maths on the bloody, on the thing altogether is setting one election. Knowing all the Hollywood elections, just one election. And that was the last Hollywood election where everybody went SNP 1 and 2 and the SNP didn't get a majority. It's not going to be that easy next time round. They should have done their stats through all the different elections and worked it out for there, as I say, but I'm not against mere voices coming to the table. But these polls are a waste of time. <sighs> hey, right, moving on. Ian Duncan Smith wants social distancing to scrap. Right. This is the same Ian Duncan Smith who set up Universal Credit and made all the changes to the benefit systems that seen 130,000 people needlessly lose their lives. This mass murderer wants you to get up close and personal so that they can open the economy. Right, so he wants social distancing scrapped so that hey, we can all get back to working right next door to each other, standing next to each other as we work. Now, I've just made my delivery. And, eh... Uh, I've just made my delivery. And everything was done with social distancing. I asked the guy his name. I PP'd the paperwork. I took my bit of the paperwork and I put his bit of the paperwork on the power. I took the power off the motor via the tailwork. We didn't have to get anywhere near each other. I put the pallet where he wanted me to put it. And then I put my pallet truck back onto the motor, folded my tail lift away, and they uh, into the motor and away. No need for any actual... Um, no need to be anywhere near each other. Social distancing can, can work in certain businesses. But Mr Duncan Smith wants it done away with. They want the economy opened up no matter what the cost is in life. All right. Michael Gove continues his attack on teachers. They want the they want the schools doing their open by the first of June. Teachers and teachers unions are not wearing it. They haven't worked to safe working practices. How do you get primary school kids to understand social distancing? Even teenagers would ignore social distancing. They've grown up in an environment where they see their friends, they hug them. You know. Anyway, Gove, um, attack on teachers are getting outrageous, is, is starting to get outrageous. You know, if you view it, I mean, that's, uh, the stuff he's coming away with. They, this is a government that's killed over 130,000 people, plus the mistakes with the coronavirus pandemic, right? If you really care about school, uh, children, you'll open up the schools. Now, what we do know is that 50 of the schools that reopened in France last week have had to be shut down because the communities that were in have seen surges and spikes in the transmission of coronavirus. But they want the schools opened up before they've got a plan in place to protect the people, the teachers, the children, and the, the children, the, the people the children come in contact with when they go home. This stuff is pure pie-in-the-sky stuff. I said the other week, I said the other day there, actually, you know, about businesses and uh, the Institute of Directors saying, 
Whoa, slow down, slow down a bit. Here, we need to sort out safe working practices for our employer, our employees. Things are not opening up as, as fast as the Conservatives would like. <coughs> the business community have been very, very sensible about this, in England especially, because they, they try to force them back to work in England. And now the education department in there is saying, whoa, hold on a wee man. Just like the business community, we'll need to go to a pace that we can work things out and how to work it. But this boy, this shower of idiots at Westminster, they have they, they have issued any proper guidance on how companies should go ahead opening up, how they should implement safe working practices for their people. And because of the way HA health and safety regulations, health and safety laws are, and they haven't been scrapped yet, and they won't be scrapped here in Scotland. Um, if you're an employer, whether it be a local authority for schools, or whether it be the Institute of Directors and their companies, you open up, as I said, and that place becomes a hot spot, and people start dying, you're getting sued. What the, what the Conservative government in, in London are doing is absolutely irresponsible. You know, it's a bit like Sarah Smith suggesting on BBC, on, on the 10 o'clock news, on the BBC, that the people of Scotland should ignore their government and follow Westminster's lead. Well, this is Westminster's lead. They want to scrap social distancing, get companies opened up before they give them clear guidance on how to do it, and get schools opened up before there's any safety measures put there for children and teachers and, and the communities they're in. That lot down there are crazy. They're screwballs. Now, the Guardian had an interesting uh, report on it last night uh, by George Minibot, right? Now, basically, what, what that uh, report was saying, I'll break it down for you, is that uh, last year, on the World Health Organization's lists of countries that were best prepared for pandemics, America and the UK came first. And what George Minibot's uh, investigation seems to have shown is that, uh, actually, the preparedness was there. Um... Bungle and Boris and Trump have decided just not to activate these a uh, pandemic uh, um, procedures, if you like, that are already in place. So, aye, it was all there. But as of last year, Boris and his bungle and bunch of a bunch of idiots privatised the the public health England's uh, stockpile, outsourced it to a uh, Mavianto, I think that's how you pronounce it. I did a wee video on it yesterday on the place in Scotland. Um, so they outsourced a, all the PPE um, storage and procurement to this mob. And they basically broke down the system that was there in place with Public Health England, Public Health Scotland. Scotland's a wee bit better prepared. You probably noticed we still have a central hub, central distribution, things like that. We haven't had the problems of having England with PPE. You know, and that's because we didn't go down that same line. We still weren't ready, we still weren't queued up enough, we still hadn't um, uh, took the advice of the Cygnus report, which we don't really know whether the Scottish Government got, got sighted or no. Although the BBC are trying to claim they did. And that's a Nicky. Nick Kemp tried to claim that they had a retired a public health official for Glasgow, for the aged in Glasgow, somehow knew that the Scottish government had, had sighted the sickness report. I haven't seen anything that says it was sighted the sickness report. In fact, as far as I know, the particular, half the uh, Commons committees and Westminster didn't get sight of the Cygnus support, never mind the devolved administrations. Anyway, according to George Minibot and The Guardian, the UK and the US were, were um, at the top of all the health organisations list of countries that were well prepared for a pandemic, but um, the Tories over the last 12 months had actually dismantled that. And uh, according to them, according to The Guardian and George Minibot, Trump just didn't trigger the procedures that were there in America. So it seems to have been a political decision. Here in the, the UK, a bungling decision. In America, it seems to have been um, 
a direct decision you know, to put these protocols in place and to get them to, uh, and to follow through the, the pandemic protocols that the UK and the US had in place already. That was an interesting report of that one. Right, I suppose we better move on to it's called the economy, stupid. Right. So figures come out on unemployment, shrinking of the economy due to coronavirus. Right? And I've been listening to these reports and I've been reading these reports for the last couple of days. So apparently an extra 850,000 people since the, since, since the start of this pandemic and the start of furlough um, since March basically have registered for universal credit. So that's an extra 150,000 people have lost their jobs. But the figures were only until the end of March. When we get to the end of April figures, we maybe see that doubled, trebled, quadrupled. What they're actually saying is it's probably unemployment is probably going to be at this point at 9%. And every day we're talking about companies going under because they can't survive this. But everybody keeps ignoring the elephant in the room. And that is when every other economy that's been put on pause is coming out the other side. We're not coming out the other side. We're going to have a Brexit cliff edge. Right? So what's happening now will be compounded by that. And don't be surprised, as I said, if we fall out of the EU at the end of June. Um, because the UK issued tariff schedules for companies dealing um, trading with the EU after Brexit and for EU companies trading into the UK. They seem to have scrapped a 62% of ta tariffs on 62% of everything coming into the UK, but that doesn't work the other way. We can, our people won't be able to get the same concessions from the, from the EU because the EU has schedules as well and their schedules are internationally recognised and they're universally recognised by the single market. So it would appear that Johnson and his cronies are setting up the UK to become the Singapore of the West. But our competitors here just won't be put up with that. They just won't buy your goods. No matter how many tariffs we scrap on things coming in, they're not going to reciprocate. And uh, they're just not going to buy your goods. So, and as we know, the trade deal, with, the trade negotiations with America are not going that well. For a start, the Americans want a veto on any for any future trade deals that the UK have with any other parts of the world. They want a veto on that, right? And as the Financial Times has pointed out, the American trade deal will only benefit the UK by 0.16% over 15 years. In other words, a trade deal with the Americans is absolutely no good to us. None. It won't compensate at all for the loss of the 40% trade that we did with the EU. Won't compensate for it at all. And we only, try, about 7% of the UK output goes to America. So you can see it would be 7.16 after this trade deal's done. No advantage to the trade deal with the UK economy at all. So that's the economy, stupid. It doesn't look good. There's nothing, there's nothing in the future that looks good. We have to get away from these self-destructive nutters down there. We really do. When you look at all this, this was self-inflicted. And it all started right after we voted no. Or after Scotland voted no. It was lied to. And coerced into voting no. Vote no. And since then, the UK government has been one disaster for, for Scotland after another. And the, the handling of this pandemic, um, the handling of the Brexit negotiations, and the vultures that are circling to pick here what's left, um, we have to get away from these nutters. They're insular, and they're stupid. Right, that's the end of my break, folks. So it's Indy Truck Davy in the truck, in the truck, coming to you from a broth where it's a beautiful morning and we're up to 20 degrees. Have a nice day. I'll speak to you all tomorrow. <laughs>